I'm Rabbi Sarah Berman. I'm the Director of Adult Education here at Central Synagogue, and I'm just thrilled that all of you have joined us this evening in the room or online. Our guest this evening is my favorite speaker of the fall. Don't tell the other speakers. Emily Bowen Cohen creates comics that explore intersectional identity. She is Jewish and a member of the Muscogee, the Creek Nation. She uses personal experience to tell stories that examine contemporary American and Jewish culture. Tonight, Emily is going to tell her story, but she's also going to help you tell yours. We're so glad that you're here and can't wait to participate together. Now, everybody who's joining us online, everybody who's joining us virtually, sometime over the next about half hour, you're going to want to make sure that you have paper and a pen or a pencil near you for the interactive piece of our, uh, of our program later. And folks joining us on Facebook, we will say goodbye to you when we head into our activity later in the evening. But we're so glad that you're here now. And now, Emily. Thanks for being here. Let's welcome Emily. Thank you. Um, first, I just want to say thank you so much to you and Central for bringing me out here this, this evening. Um, I also just wanted to say um, I live in Los Angeles, but I'm really grateful that there is a space here for Jews of color. Um, even though I'm far away, it's still very meaningful to me that it exists here in the, and in the Jewish community. Mm. So also before we begin, um, I just want to acknowledge that many of us in the room are feeling a lot of pain right now because of what's happening in Israel. I have family in Israel. Um, I have family, my native family is very supportive of the Palestinian people. And so in my own household, there's um, a real tension going on. And I know that's true for a lot of us in this room here tonight. So with all of that going on, I really, really am grateful that you came out tonight for this event. Um, my editor is the Native American author, Cynthia Ladig-Smith. And she knew that I was coming and doing these talks um, at synagogues and in Jewish spaces. And she told me that storytelling is a form of medicine. And so I hope that my story, which I wrote because I wanted to wrestle with the trauma of Native American history and also some personal loss, I hope it can be a way that we can heal a little bit or at least you know, open our hearts and imagine that paths to harmony are possible. So with that, this is Two Tribes. Um, it's a graphic novel about a girl who, like me, is Jewish and a member of the Muscogee Nation. Um, you might have heard of the Muscogee Nation as the Creek Nation. Is, does that sound more familiar to some people? <laughs> no, um, that was sort of the old-fashioned way that we were that we were the old-fashioned way that we were named. We now prefer to call ourselves the Muscogee Nation. So, with that, um, Mia, she's a twelve. She's a twelve-year-old girl, and she gets fed up with her Jewish mom and her new stepdad, and she decides to steal her bat mitzvah money and run away so she can go be with her Native American family in Oklahoma. And in the process of this adventure, which nobody should do if they're 12 years old, it's a terrible idea, Mia learns how to reconcile both parts of her identity. And today I'm gonna tell you about myself and how some of my real life experiences inspired parts of the book. So are there any writers out here? Or maybe writers, no? Yay, okay, <laughs> a couple. Um, perhaps you know that um, writing a somewhat personal story requires a, a certain amount of vulnerability. Um, you have to, in order to create a character who feels real and authentic, you have to truly investigate painful parts of your past and in the process of writing this book about a young girl who was exploring her identity, um, I had to come to terms with my own. And I'll also say this book 
it originally started as a memoir, but um, my agent said she could not sell a book like that. <laughs> so she urged me to change it to a graphic novel for middle grade, which is eight to 12 year olds, which I guess is a lot more popular. <laughs> um, that wasn't an easy decision, but I'm glad I made it because in that process, I really had to simplify some of the things that the girl, the girl was, the, my character was going through. Um, I had to understand my memories more like chunks of content in a way um, that I could move around to tell a story and turning my experiences into an understandable narrative was really grounding. Um, it made me gain a greater confidence to understand what I believed was true. Um, okay, so it is Native Heritage Month. So I wanna share with you the history of my background. My father's side are, as I said, Muscogee Creek. This means that they were, um, when first encountered by European settlers, they were living in what is now Georgia. Um, my mother's side of the family are Ashkenazi Jews, which means they are from Eastern Europe. Um, I, I'm, a significant number of people in, the, in America are Ashkenazi, so that might be familiar if you are here from Central Synagogue. Um, although they may appear very different, my father and my mother's family histories share similarities. Um, they were both forced to move from their original homelands. Okay, this is sort of, <laughs> this is sort of a romanticized version of what my great grandparents would have looked like. <laughs> um, they were forced to move from their native lands on the East Coast and relocated to Indian territory, which is now Oklahoma, which is now called the state of Oklahoma. Um, does anybody in the room want to tell me what the process of removing my tribe was called? Trail yeah, <laughs> that trail of tears. Very good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I actually always do appreciate when people know that. Um, as you'll hear, I grew up in Oklahoma, and we actually never learned that history in school because it was, uh, it, it was they didn't want to talk about the bad stuff. So I'm always kind of a little thrilled when um, people ha ha recognize and understand Native American history. Good. <laughs> so my maternal great-grandparents also faced exile. Um, they fled pogroms in Eastern Europe in the 19th and 20th centuries. Um, oh, why don't, it's, there, I, I want to make sure they're up there too. Okay, um, so why did I feel the need to go all the way back to my great-grandparents? Um, well, this was because the way that I learned the story of my family history really had a profound effect on me and the way I felt about myself growing up. Um, when I was in my teenage years and just beginning to figure out who I was, I didn't have access to my Native American family so I would take a look, take a look um, for answers in books because I was a very good student. <laughs> Likewise, this is a, one of the panels from the book. Mia lives really far away from her native family. And unfortunately, what's available to her is a kind of a popular book about a girl abducted by Indians. This is in, called an Indian captive narrative. Maybe you've come across them. It was a really popular form of literature um, in the past. One of the first mass-produced kind of books was Indian captive narratives. I drew a generic version of what this might look like, and I thought it was important to show kind of the most stereotypical version of Native Americans because the books represent such a biased point of view. They were really written to promote uh, European settlement of the United States, and so they often focus on Native Americans as savages and doing really mean and terrible things. 
and at best having gross food, <laughs> which is always a part in these books. There's always like a part where like the poor little blonde girl has to eat something really disgusting and there's no salt because they don't know, Indians don't know to put salt on their food or something. But this is all because the, it, it's told from the European point of view. So Mia and I both learned about our own history from these outdated sources. But if she hadn't picked up one of these particular books, she'd still be growing up indigenous in a country that was founded, you know, trying to destroy her ancestors. So when you first go into history class as a child, uh, you can hear what people think of you in the history, which is kind of that you're a loser, <laughs> which is a difficult way to grow up. And I felt like it was important to show that truth about growing up Native in America, that you're faced to front with that kind of history in your classroom right from the very beginning. So we both learned about these, we both grew up this way, Mia and myself. But the story that was actually behind our two families um, was a, even more complicated than that. After our families were displaced from their original homelands, both of, the, both of my sides, they worked really hard to make homes here. My, my Ashkenazi Jewish side of the family, they moved to Pittsburgh, they had a dress shop. And my native side of the family, we're now in Oklahoma, and the tribe founded Tulsa, the city of Tulsa actually, and they started a brand new life in Oklahoma. However, things were, as, as time went by, these are my grandparents, um, things seemed to get a little bit more uh, bifurcated. My grandparents on my paternal side had a significantly different experience in Oklahoma. Um, my Jewish grandparents could participate in the American dream. They were able to buy a house. They, my grandfather and my grandmother raised a family in New Jersey, Montclair, New Jersey, if anyone's from New Jersey. And they were able to support these growing families. This was challenging for my um, father's parents, my paternal grandparents. In their new home in Oklahoma, uh, life just wasn't set up to accommodate indigenous success. That's a kind of a polite way to put it. Uh, Native Americans were denied access to well-paying jobs. And my grandmother, pictured there, she went to an Indian boarding school, which has been in the news recently, so I think you know, people are more familiar with it these days. She went to an Indian boarding school where she was taught to become a domestic servant, which is a totally, I mean, what she did it, it was, she was, it was a great thing to do with your life, but that was really the only option that was available to her. So my, my mom, that's my mom, she grew up in a really nice house in New Jersey, and my father, my father was raised by my grandmother, as a, she was a single mom, um, and she, they lived in a rented house in a really rural part of Oklahoma with no running water and no electricity, which at the time, he was born in 1945, was typical in rural Oklahoma for the Native American community. So how did these two guys meet? Because my dad was from like this forgotten part of Oklahoma and my mom was from this bustling suburb in New Jersey. So my father, they met in a very American way. My father did have the opportunity to you know, chase his American dream. He was a really promising student at the University of Oklahoma. He was the first in his family to go to college. He was studying to become a pharmacist and at the time Harvard had a policy of recruiting minority students. I don't think they do that anymore. <laughs> um, but they reached out to my father and um, they invited him to attend Harvard Medical School. They recruited him to attend Harvard Medical School. And my mom was at Wellesley and I don't know if you guys, you guys are not college students yet. Well, maybe, when, someday, two years, okay. Um, 
Well, my mom had, uh, her roommate was Pueblo, which is also known as Navajo. And she invited my mom to go with her to a party. It was like a Native American student mixer. And she said, so that she said, come with me to the party. So of course, you know, my, my mom met my dad there. So when you go, if you go and you have a roommate, always accept their invitations. Cause <laughs> that's the best, that's all, you, you'll never know what's gonna happen. So my mom and dad met at this party. And then, oh, there's no one here yet. Okay. They had my, that's my mom and my dad and my older sister. And then they had, I'm a twin. So they had my twin sister and me. That's, that's me. <laughs> and uh, my dad finished his residency and he moved back to Oklahoma. He decided to take uh, all of us there because he wanted to do good. He wanted to provide medical care for the people in our native community. This is the main street of the town that we grew up on. It's called Okima, Oklahoma. It's about it's a town of about 3,000 people. Um, even to this day, there's still just one stoplight. It is also the home of Woody Guthrie. That is our claim to fame. <laughs> the Woody Guthrie vessel is there. That's, that's what's there. <laughs> um, this was really, these memories of my time in Okima were really what began my need to write this book. It's a small town, but like about a quarter of the population is not just Native American, but from my tribe, which is you know, pretty unheard of even in Oklahoma. So my father worked at the Creek Nation Hospital and the great thing about where we lived was our house, we could walk to his hospital. And once we got to his hospital, we could look right at our school from where we were, from where we were standing, from my dad's office basically. It was, it was in the heart of what people now call um, Indian country, if you hear that term sometimes. You can, people would just assume that you were Native American. It's really unlike any other part of the country. So it was pretty easy to identify as Native American in Okima, Oklahoma, but it was not so easy to identify as Jewish. We were smack in the middle of the Bible Belt, which means there was a church on every single corner. And um, the division between, we have a di the division between church and state even though it was fuzzy, meaning even though we were at a public school, we still had to go hear the Bible man once a month. Everyone would have to like get out of classes and it was mandatory you sit down and listen to the Bible man. And the Bible man would come and he would share passages with us from the New Testament. And he would say, I've got toys and candy for good Christian girls and boys. So, I mean, who wouldn't want that? That's fantastic. So this was all very exciting and I loved participating in it. Not just that, but my grandma, my dad's mom, she, she was devoted to her Baptist church. Native Americans um, were forced to become Christian and they adapted and came to really love their church in their own way. My, grandma, my family on my dad's side to this day are very de devoted to that church. So I was hearing from my school and from my grandma about the beauty of their religion. In fact, so much so I came home from the Bible man singing about Jesus. I sang the tiny little baby, wait, he's got the tiny little baby in his hands, which I didn't realize was even a Christian song, um, but it was, <laughs> and my mom knew it, and she could hear me singing from the kitchen. She said, what are you singing? We don't sing songs like that. We're Jewish. We don't sing songs about Jesus. <laughs> because we were always surrounded by Christian influences, my mom was pushed to, uh, pushed to make us have a Jewish identity. She had to battle all of these other things around us. She was pushed to remind us of our Jewish tribe. So in order to attend religious services, 
my family had a house in Tulsa, the closest big town to us. And, oh God, getting to Tulsa, it took forever. It took like two, it, I mean, it felt like forever. It was two hours, you know, when I was, I think I was six or seven. But once we got there, it was like this magical place where we came from a really small town and there were big hotels. And when I saw the synagogue, I couldn't believe how big and beautiful it was. It was like a palace. And I was, of course, I, you know, I couldn't believe it. This is, I'm part of this. This is all for me, you know. I, I was, could it be, I, could it be I really belong here? It was very exciting. But then I went to Hebrew school. <laughs> and I had a good reason to wonder if I would fit in. Because like, like, this, like the fancy city of Tulsa, these kids were fancy and um, they could, they could see pretty quickly that I was not from around there. My teacher told me to take a seat in the back, told all of us students to open up our prayer books. And as I walked past, I heard these two mean girls. This is Chloe and Reagan. <laughs> and she said, they said to each other, did you see the way she wears her pants? Psst. Hey, Emily, why is your face so dark? Is it because you're dirty. <laughs> in Oklahoma, when I when I was growing up there, if you had a little bit of a tan, everyone knew that meant you were you were Indian, and they would call you that. They knew you were Indian. It wasn't it was before Native American. <laughs> you were Indian. So you can imagine um, this could make you feel really isolated when you walk into what's supposed to be your spiritual home, and people tell you don't belong. Um, that is a really, that's a moment that you really have to wrestle with. However, it would introduce me to something that I would contend with for the rest of my life, which was, okay, I'm Jewish, but I am different. You know, even today, it's pretty unusual to be a Native American Jewish person. <laughs> so it, it began that way. However, at the time, um, I also started feeling isolated from my Native American family. Oh, sorry, I'm skipping over poor Mia here. Okay, Mia in the book goes through a similar experience. She's having Shabbat dinner with her rabbi, um, which is something I do in my family, but when I was just with the teens, they were like, I didn't have my rabbi over for dinner. <laughs> I'm saying, you could please have your rabbi over for dinner if you have a rabbi. <laughs> We do it in my family, uh, but and Mia's family does too. And she's trying to reach out to her, to her, the grown-ups in her life, and tell them that she's having, she's struggling with this. I'm, I'm a mom, and so I know how this can be too. But her mom doesn't, can't, isn't able to really listen to her in that moment, which is unfortunate because. Let's see, there we go. Because. It leads to a conversation, and the rabbi, he doesn't know her background, and he makes a joke about wild Indians. You remember those jokes? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, it was, people used to say it, it was a, a turn of phrase that people would say, but it really profoundly affects Mia. And everyone sort of dismisses it, like, oh, it's just a joke, you know. Um, but for her, it really isn't. She feels really isolated and really alone, and, a, as I did when I felt like people around me didn't understand who I was. Okay, so one of the reasons that my mother also wanted to go to Tulsa so bad was that my, my big sister was gonna have her bat mitzvah, which is the coming of age ceremony for Jewish people. She was turning 13, uh, and we had it in Tulsa, Oklahoma. This is me with the whole family. Um, unfortunately, six months after her bat mitzvah, my father passed away. And um, he died when my twin sister and I were nine years old. He had a brain aneurysm and it happened very suddenly. And there were a lot of, there were a lot of conversations that I wish I could have had with him. And one of the things that I really enjoyed about writing this book was through Mia's story, I was able to have those conversations. It's no, it's it's not a coincidence that coincidence that Mia's 
father is named Van. That's my dad's middle name. One of my favorite passages, or panels, I should say, is a memory that Mia has of going to the pond and catching tadpoles with her dad um, in their backyard in Oklahoma, which is something that I used to do too. I got to recall this memory of my father and through Mia, it, I could kind of capture it a little bit again. So by the time Jenny, that's my twin sister, <laughs> by the time we had our bat mitzvah, uh, we were living in Montclair, New Jersey with my maternal grandparents and my mom. Um, my, my dad's mother had passed away and we had lost touch completely with his side of the family. Uh, on top of that, in New Jersey, we were often the only Native Americans people had ever met. So I was still a Native American person, but I no longer had that community around me. For the first time, I came face to face with the myth of the American Indian. In New Jersey, when people ask me, what are you anyway? This is, this is all the stuff they thought of when I said Native American. They knew about being Native American from comic books. At the time, butter boxes had this lady on it. She's, she's gone. <laughs> I don't know if that's good or bad. She's not there anymore. They knew about it from movies. They definitely knew about it from cigarette boxes. Uh, they knew about all of this stuff. And I couldn't really, I did, obviously I, I can't live up to any of that. And I didn't even at the time m know how to argue it because they all spoke with so much authority about what an American Indian is. So I kind of was like, I guess they're right. I'm not really a Native American. After all, I can't possibly live up to those expectations. Mia has a similar experience at school as well. She's confronted by, this is Justin, a boy at her school, and he's quizzing her in this way as well. He finds out she's Native American and asks her a series of questions. Can you ride a horse? Can you shoot a bow and arrow? Oh. Do you have a secret Indian name? And she has to say, no, I d I'm not any of those things. So he just says, I guess you're not really a Native American. And like me, Mia kind of was like, yeah, I guess you're right. I'm not any of those things. I, I, don't know what, I, don't know, I don't know what being a real Indian is. So in, in writing, we would call this moment for Mia a catalyst. She is forced into action because she's feeling like all of these forces are surrounding her and she's gonna have to do something very drastic. It was the rabbi's wild Indian comment and Justin's kind of bullying at school. She doesn't know what it means to be native and she's isolated from her Jewish family, so she has to run away. <laughs> she actually shouldn't do that, don't do that. But that's what she feels called to do. Uh, and I really wanted this too because I related to this as well. I was also feeling isolated at the time. Uh, I, my point of view was not being understood or like I guess seen by the people around me. I was at the time going to my husband's Orthodox and, and we were going to an Orthodox Jewish synagogue and there weren't a whole lot of Jews of color there and I was getting a lot of questions about growing up in Oklahoma <laughs> because you know, if you're Jewish, why would you be in Oklahoma? So there were just like a lot of questions and I was feeling isolated from my Jewish community. And I also, um, I have three kids and they were really little, also Jewish Native Americans. <laughs> and uh, what was I gonna teach them? So these two, this was my catalyst moment as well. 20 years after my father died, I decided to reunite with my Native American family again. And that was easier said than done because, oh my goodness, okay. So I was going back to them after 20 years and I was married with three kids and I was keeping kosher and I wasn't driving on Shabbat. I was like, what are they gonna think of me? And it, melt, it, it meant so much to me that, that they find me like a part of their family 
and I was scared that they would think I was super weird, <laughs> and worse, that they wouldn't even remember me. So it took a long time to finally screw up the courage to get on a, get on a plane to Tulsa, <laughs> but we did it, and there was a happy ending. This is me and my family, my kids and my husband. Um, when we went back to Oklahoma and reunited with my Native American family, this is some of my dad's cousins, they told me a lot of stories about my dad, which I really, really wanted to hear. They also shared with me things about Muscogee culture, but not in some kind of woo-woo way. It was just like, yeah, this is the stuff we do. This is why we do it. It's just part of our life. <laughs> and that nonchalance mm, really was an antidote to having to feel like you had to live up to some myth of being Native. They also really just accepted me for being Jewish. They fed me kosher food <laughs> because they knew my mom and they knew that was just who I was. So Mia goes on her own journey with her Oklahoma family. She yearns to bring her Jewish and Native family together. You know, it was part of her, I, mean, I remember feeling this way, like there was nothing I wanted more than to, you know, for my mom, my, my father had passed away, but uh, there was nothing I wanted more for them to be able to sit down together at a table. So Mia goes for this. And I include this panel because it can be super, super awkward. <laughs> If you're bringing two sides of your family together, sometimes, you know, it's just a little weird. And part of her journey is to become comfortable with how uncomfortable that can be. So that's what that panel is about. But in the end, everybody gets together over a Shabbat meal, including, including the rabbi. <laughs> and they have a beautiful time together um, sitting. And uh, I ha I'm happy to say this is true. My Oklahoma family came and visited me in Los Angeles. And we had a Shabbat meal together. And it was a little awkward sometimes. But I wouldn't change it for anything because it's really one of the most beautiful memories that I have. So, so thank you. I think that's what I have for the talk. We, we have an exercise. We could do questions. We have, how much time do we have? Uh, we have half an hour. Oh, we have half an hour. Okay. Plenty of time. Okay. So. Why don't we do questions? Okay. Great. Okay. okay. I'm going to stand up for this. Does anybody have any questions? And I'll repeat the questions. Make sure I get them right. Does anybody have any questions? Yes. Oh, okay. I see you and you. We should go. Okay. Bye. I saw you first. Please, what's your question? So since we have so many folks joining us online, oh, sure. I'm going to come around with a microphone so they can oh, hear your question. Oh, good. I don't so even have to repeat it. Exactly. Who okay. did you call on first? This young man. <laughs> Back here. Uh, yeah. I, I was just wondering, what made you choose to like um, make Mia's story like a little bit different from your own, but not be like exactly the same? Okay. Thank you for that question. I chose to make Mia's story different than my own because I felt like once I changed it from real life to fiction, I had to make it a whole new story. I was telling my story, f you know, as like a as a woman in her 30s, and if I'm changing it to Mia as a 12-year-old, there's so much about that that's different for her. Uh, also, I mean, she's in a different She's in a different part of her life. She's figuring out her identity instead of trying to like figuring out her identity for her family. So I also felt like it made the story better. There are things you can't, if you're telling the truth, you know, you have to tell the truth. But if you're making up stuff, I mean, she can steal her bat mitzvah money and then run away. Like That is something I would never do. And I wouldn't recommend anybody else do it either but you can do that in a made-up story. So it was kind of freeing to be able to just whatever <laughs> she can, she's gonna get on that bus. <laughs> Thank you for your question. Okay. All right, I'm coming over. And anybody in the Zoom room or on Facebook, we encourage you to drop your questions in the chat. 
So we know that like writing is like really powerful. Okay. So what do you hope that your work inspires mm. in the world and what change oh. do you hope to see off your story being shared? Okay, wow. I'm really glad you asked that question because I think when you're, I wrote and drew this. So when you're putting all of that time and work into something, I mean, you're really like, oh, I'm going to change the world. <laughs> I mean, I was like, this is going to be like world peace. <laughs> this is going to solve everything. But, okay, what would I want to, but concretely, one thing I think it, I would like it to change is that um, rabbis and other people, who in uh, other um, authorities in the Jewish world no longer make wild Indian jokes. <laughs> Just and, and that also goes for other kinds of jokes about other ethnicities. I mean, I think there are so many Jews of color now and probably always has, they always have been. Um, I think it's time for people in, in positions of authority to be really, really aware of that because it can be really damaging to young people who don't fit in exactly with like, you know, into the box. So that's one concrete thing, and I say that every single time. I don't, did I mention, I, that actually happened to me on a number of occasions that I've heard those jokes. So, okay, that's one concrete thing. Um, I also hope that Native Americans are seen like, you know, regular people. <laughs> <laughs> walking around in the world today, they're your doctor, and you know, they're the author who comes to visit a synagogue. <laughs> uh, that is also what I hope comes out of it, and also world peace. Okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, when you were growing up, did you ever feel like you had oh. to choose between being Jewish or Christian? Oh, that's a good question. Did I ever feel like I had to choose? I didn't feel like I had to choose because my mom was really clear. She was like, nope, it's not happening. Nope, we could, I mean, and my grandma, we had, we went to visit them on, you know, Christmas and Easter. Um, and my mom was like, we cannot have a Christmas tree. So, uh, I mean, I think I got the message really young that like, that's just not going to happen. But that's just me. I mean, I think my sisters, for example, um, they, they married non-Jewish men. I think they felt less like they had, you know, they, it's not that they didn't think that they had to choose, but it's more like they were sort of kind of less passionate <laughs> about searching for their identity than I was. So they're just sort of like, we're just normal. <laughs> I don't know. No, normal is, that sounds terrible, but they're like, we're regular, and you're doing all this crazy stuff, but we're just going to like stay low because that's where we're comfortable. I think that's what it is. I was more comfortable sort of searching for a spiritual life, I want to say. <laughs> and they're, you know, it's just not for them. All right, one more back here, then we'll go to the Zoom room, and then okay. we'll come back into okay. the room. <laughs> um. How did you navigate through the risks of cultural appropriation, mm. especially when there are so many different yeah. cultures and stories intertwined in your comic? Mm. Do you mean like, how did I try to not do things that were culturally insensitive myself when I was writing it? Or? Uh, yes. Yes, Along okay. <laughs> so this is where I do my pitch for collaboration um, as a writer and in any kind of thing you do in your life. My, I have a number of editors, and I'm very lucky to have been published um, by Hartram, which is a native-focused imprint at HarperCollins. And my editor is also Muskogee, which is a great gift, because I could rely on her to kind of check me um, for things that might need explaining, or if, if I wasn't saying it quite exactly, you know, the, just the best way to represent things that had been so, that have been culturally appropriated in the past. And I'll say that's true for writing like a 12-year-old too. Like, 
the editors also would check me and say, this doesn't sound like a kid would actually say it. And that was one of the really nice parts of working with really talented, great people. <laughs> So a couple from our Zoom oh, room great. and Facebook. Okay. Um, I'm intrigued by this question. What similarities do you find that tie your two cultures together, especially from a spiritual perspective? Mm. That's a very nice question. Well, luckily I have an answer. <laughs> uh, because of my background um, being religious, I had an opportunity to spend a lot of time you know, reading Torah and being more invested in my Jewish life. Uh, and in that practice, I learned more deeply about Genesis and the creation story from the Jewish point of view. So when I met my native family and they shared with me the Muskogee creation story, and I'll tell you what it is, I was able to pick up on similarities um, which I don't think I might have earlier in my life. So, okay, so I'll tell you. So the Muskogee creation story is that when the earth was first formed, the world was covered in a really thick fog, and it was pitch black, like in Genesis, when everything's dark. And it was, in the Muskogee tradition, it was so dark, it was really scary. And not just people, but animals and like plants, wanted to reach out to each other, to comfort each other. Then a fog came, I'm sorry, a wind came and the fog lifted, like there was light, and whatever you were clinging to became part of your family. It became part of your, it was became your clan. And that's why in our tradition, we have a clan system. So my grandmother is bird clan, meaning like that's who was spiritually close to her during this scary time. But it goes by the mother. So my dad is how I am native, which means I am not bird clan. <laughs> if you're, I, I don't know if this is true, but it's kind of funny. Um, if you are native by your dad, then your clan is a potato. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you get. You get a potato. Um, but in the Jewish tradition, um, it also is matrilineal. So if your mother is Jewish, then you're also Jewish. So one of the really great ways that I've learned to kind of um, reconcile both of my tribes is that I'm, you know, Muskogee Nation and I'm Jewish clan. And it's something that already exists in my native tradition, and it's understandable when you introduce yourself to any other native person, what you mean when you say that. So I love that question. <laughs> so I'm gonna ask you a different question now okay. from one of our folks <laughs> online okay. who is herself oh. Um, oh. Native American um, with multiple, uh, multiple tribes and Jewish oh. in North Dakota. She's wondering if you were exposed to Native American spiritual practices growing up, like powwows, mm -hmm. prayer, and now, how do you deal with the fact that so many native foods are not kosher? <laughs> That's an excellent question. Um, first of all, hello. I'm so happy you're out there. <laughs> uh, That's I have Pam. You're talking it's to Pam. Pam. Hi, Pam. Huh? Hey, cousin. Uh, nice to hear from you. Let's see. How do, okay, so how do I deal with all the native foods that aren't kosher? Yeah. So, yeah, it's kind of a bummer. Uh, I really wanted to try some stuff, but I held back. Luckily, one of our traditional foods in the Muskogee uh, tradition is safki, <laughs> which you'll read about in the book. It's, uh, it's, a, it's made out of cornmeal and lye, and it's fermented in big crocks. It sort of tastes like poi if you've ever been to Hawaii. It's sort of like, anyway. But when I went to, it, uh, it wasn't a powwow, but it was, a big birthday party for a, a relative. <laughs> I was keeping kosher, and I was like grilling them on like how the <laughs> how the safki was prepared. Like, mm, what kind of dish do you use for that? And <laughs> and if you keep kosher, you'll recognize this. You know, is it just corn? <laughs> so I was able to try some of the 
some of the things. Um, did I grow up with any spiritual practices? Yes, in Oklahoma especially. Um, more cultural than spiritual, because my father was not a religious person, but because he was like the town doctor, we would go to a lot of cultural events, and that included many, many powwows. And in, in the Muscogee tradition, you do a kind of dance called stomp dance. So basically, the big difference between us and other people is they have big drums, we have little drums. So that's part of the things that I got to experience when I was still living in Oklahoma, and I grew up with those. I think that counts as a spiritual tradition. Yeah, I'm gonna say yes. <laughs> Thank you, Pam. So we'll come back into the physical room and then hop back to our online audience. Oh. Hi, and and thank you. Um, I want to return to the first thing you said about the difficult time, and I want to ask you a political question. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. That it's a difficult time because of potentially two different narratives. Although I think we can mm -hmm. hold the mm -hmm. the plight of the Israelis and the plight of the Gazans and Palestinians together. But my my question for you is: On the one hand, there is a narrative about Israel, which is that it's the mm -hmm. settler yeah. colony of Europeans who came and settled, and in some arguments, committing genocide against the original native inhabitants of that place. And then on the other hand, there's a well-documented history of, of, of Europeans yeah. coming to colonize North and Central and South America, but North America, and displacing and re-educating, in quotes, and then actually committing genocide, <laughs> I yeah. mean, actually trying to destroy native peoples, um, what might you say to a portion of the American left right now that is, <laughs> that, and I say the American left in particular, yes. that is criticizing on the one hand the, the narrative for Israel and yet perfectly comfortable with living in the United States mm. um, and comfortable with, for example, just making a, um, uh, land acknowledgement before they go on to do whatever. Um, yeah. Okay, so first of all, I am a children's book author. <laughs> so Emily, if I may reframe yes. that to talk about <laughs> your experience. <laughs> okay, as great. Not a spokesperson for a people, <laughs> right. you're a spokesperson for no, your no, no, life no. and your yes, experience. Yes, yeah. yeah, okay. <laughs> oh my gosh. This is a really, really, what do I, well, Okay, what do I say? I say, yeah, I know, you're right. What do I say to wh when people, uh, you know, it is so hard. I, I have to say, uh, okay, you're asking, so I'm gonna tell you. <laughs> it's really, really hard to see pictures of uh, Gazans and not see your family as a Native American person. They look like your family and um, seeing people in small places, you know, grow together. That's just such a familiar narrative and it's never, and I will tell you it's never really, and I think part of the reason why it's so, it feels like family and it, because it's never been acknowledged for Native Americans, really. And you're right, what, what do I say when people seem to be fine living here in America and comfortable with being on Stolen land. Ugh. Yeah, I mean, but criticizing Israel. I, you know what? Like, I don't even, I don't even get that far. I think well, I'm just get to like. Um, I, I can't help but feel for people who are hurting, in Israel, and in Palestine, and. <laughs> That pain right now is too much for me to kind of get past. Even, let's just acknowledge that together. Like, I'm in pain for everyone in this situation. I, like, on a, I don't, yeah, and I, I can't even get that far yet. I just wanna, let's just start there and we can, can we agree on that? And then I can get into, you know, who's, who was where when? <laughs> or what are you doing now? And all that stuff, yeah. That's the best I could tell you. Thank you. You're welcome. 
<laughs> I have a question about yeah. you and your sisters. Yes. And your children and their cousins. And yes. so you have <laughs> two identities potentially, and they have two, but they al also left your mother's identity. So hmm. are, are, is, is the whole family understanding of each other? Does the next generation understand all three, uh, the Christian, the Jewish, the Native American? Hmm. More familial question, which is probably yeah. easier for children to look at it. Uh, <laughs> well, I don't know about that. <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm going to say I'm the most religious out of all of my family members. And I'm also the only person who married somebody Jewish. Uh, so I think for them, living more of a secular, cultural, culturally Jewish life is really comfortable for them. I'm the outlier. Do they do live a culturally Yeah, they have a cultural, yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah, I didn't mean to misunderstand. Yeah, I shouldn't misrepresent. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> I certainly shouldn't misrepresent my sister's life. <laughs> they are Jewish. Their husbands are not. Kids are Jewish and Native American. So they took on your mother's identity. They did. Yeah, they, yes, yes. I mean, they're pretty secular, but I mean, I'm really the outlier. <laughs> Had I identified in an orthodox way before I married my husband? No. He was just so dreamy. I mean, <laughs> I, what can I tell you? <laughs> so, Emily, since yeah. we only have about eight minutes left together, and I do want you to, to take us into the activity, oh, I'm going to ask sure. you one final question yes. that will segue us sure. into the yeah. activity, which is from our online audience. Why did you decide to write this as a graphic novel? Oh, okay. I love that question. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm an art, I was an artist first. <laughs> I studied animation. So I've always been comfortable telling stories with pictures. And it was harder for me to wrap my, my head around the idea of making dialogue and writing a story structure. That was, so, so that's like, but that's just sort of the technical thing, I guess. Um, however, I do think because in the native tradition, um, you know, we, we tell stories by talking. It, in a way, it sort of makes more sense for me to tell this story in, as a graphic novel because it's visual as well and it's not just text. It sort of feels more, um, like it just makes more sense to me. Yeah, I think that's, that's, that's how I'd answer that question. So we'll <laughs> say good night to our Facebook audience and thank you all so much for joining us. Zoom audience, stick around. Um, and Emily will take us through a quick sure. activity. Hooray. All right. How, I'm so glad we have time for this. Okay. Okay. All right. So what we're going to talk about, I, I've got another slide for this. Okay. I'm, this is just like the very basic way that I started thinking about how to write my story as a comic book. So, okay. Basic story. Beginning, middle, end. But it's not as easy as you might think. So we're going to go through a little exercise to kind of go through how you might start to structure this. Um, it, it's pretty easy to think about a beginning. It's pretty, it's pretty easy to think about an end. But the middle part, I think, is really challenging. Because what is that? So we're going to pass around some index cards. Yes, we have index cards. Perfect. If we, I hope we have time. Okay, we're going to do it. We're going to try it. Okay. So what I'm going to ask you to do is think about something that you're sure of in your life. It doesn't necessarily have to be your identity. So like, for example, what, is, what do you know about yourself that is true? Like, I don't know. I am a swimmer. That could be something. Or I, may, I am Jewish, if you feel like that's something that you feel very secure about. So that is going to be your end. Yeah. But the hard so like uh, so like for the Bible man thing, like this is sort of how I think about it. Let's see. Yeah. The end of that is my mom says you're Jewish. Okay, I'm Jewish. Okay, but then it leads to the question of like, okay, but what was I at the beginning? That's kind of harder to answer for me anyway. Like, what were you before you were something? All right, so my case, I was a student who liked singing songs about Jesus. <laughs> before I found out I was Jewish. Wait, I think I have yeah, I have a little icon for that, too. <laughs> so just quickly take a minute. Think about 
where you ended or where you began, whatever's easiest for you. I like doing pictures, I like drawing pictures, but if it's more comfortable for you to write, you can do that too. Thank you. And then if anybody is comfortable sharing, <laughs> I'll give you a couple of minutes. Yes. Okay, the question was, what is the relationship between Creek and Cherokee in Oklahoma? All right. Um, I'm not sure that they teach it like this anymore, but at one point we were considered one of the five civilized tribes. Yeah, that's gone out of fashion. I think we just call it, I think it's just the five tribes now, but the five civilized tribes, okay. Cherokee, Creek, Choctaw, Seminole, and Chickasaw, I think. Um, is that right? I'm looking to you, I think you're a teacher. <laughs> is that correct? Okay, five civilized tribes. We were all considered, the, we were considered civilized because we did many things like the European settlers. We farmed, we had systems of government. Um, we were also all sent from our original homelands to Indian territory, which is now Oklahoma, through the Trail of Tears in many different paths. <laughs> is my mother still living? Yes, my mother is still living. She's waiting for me right now in Long Island. <laughs> Oof. That, thank you, Carol, for that question. What did my mother think? Um, she was a little nervous. I, you know, it's not easy to raise three girls by yourself when your husband, after husband passes away, and they, uh, they had a difficult relationship. As, con as confirmed when I went to Oklahoma. So she was really nervous about what, what, what this book was gonna be about. Um, but she has seen this talk, and so she has approved it. <laughs> and she says, do what you have to do. So, so thank you for that question. I might not mention you said it. <laughs> You're welcome. Have my, my own children? Yes. I'm going to Wellesley College tomorrow to give this talk to my, my daughter is a, oh, I'm gonna brat on her. My daughter is on the executive board of her Hillel and of the Native American student group. So we're all gonna get together and I'm gonna, I'm gonna share this talk with them tomorrow. Wish me luck. <laughs> okay. Does anybody wanna share? Okay, I tell you what, you don't even have to share your, just who wants to share an end? Does anybody wanna share an end? Yes. Stuyvesant, is that where you guys are from? Yeah. yeah. Okay, can I, will you share your beginning? What were you before you were Stuyvesant? Oh man, I can't draw. Um, <laughs> you don't have to draw, that's okay. I basically, um, I oh, that's really um, interesting. No, no, because that's the middle, right? Okay. We're, we're going to get to the middle. You don't even have to worry about it yet. Oh. Yeah. So you've got the end is Stuyvesant, and the beginning is you're the only Asian kid. One, One of the only Asian kids. Okay. Um, that is the beginning of a great story. So thank you. Thank you for sharing it, too. That's, that is not easy to do. Okay. All right. It, do you want to share, too? Great. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> Okay, what's your end? Um, I'm Mr. Worldwide. Hey, okay. <laughs> okay, Mr. Worldwide, where'd you start? Okay, so the start <laughs> of my uh, story is I'm yeah. from Shanghai. Nice, okay. And then the middle is... Um, wait, wait, we haven't gotten to the middle yet. We just need the end and the beginning. You oh. know, we're not doing middles yet. No. Oh, sorry. Just the end. Of the, so end uh, is Mr. Worldwide, beginning is you're from Shanghai. Yes. All right, that's all you need. Okay, why am I doing that? Because to tell a really good story, the, the middle is, that's, that's where all the good stuff is. Or the most challenging part as a writer, because it's the ups and downs, it's really the like exciting part of the story. Because like in life, here I go, ooh, wait, oh, my animation, ooh, the middle. Like in life, you know, 
getting to where you end up in, that's where you really have to, that's where you, that's where you have to dig really deep and challenge yourself. Like we're talking about the catalyst moment. Like Mia had to go through a lot of really hard stuff, including a whole long trip on a bus to Oklahoma. Yeah. And that's how she could get to the sweet, her sweet ending. <laughs> but at, when you're writing that middle, you want it to be ups and downs. And that's where you have to dig and say, like, what, what do I really care about? What is this Mr. Worldwide? What's going to make it even better that you're Mr. Worldwide? Like, what happened in between? Why do we care? Why are we rooting for you? Why are we like, yes, he did it? So anyway, you don't have to answer that question, but that's what's going to go in the middle. And OK. <laughs> if you want to, you can scribble down some notes. And that's just the beginning of a story right there. Does anybody have any ups and downs they want to share? <laughs> Does any, OK, can I ask you about Stuyvesant? Was it hard? Was it hard to get to Stuyvesant? <laughs> um, or is it just like you just breeze through? Because that's not a great story. Uh, so <laughs> the the better story is I went to Hunter College High School before Stuyvesant. Okay. Which is something not a lot of people expect because they expect you to stay in that school till you're oh. graduating. Yeah. Um, people that are interesting. Okay. Did you have to meet some challenges? <laughs> yes. Some challenging people, did they? When I moved to Stuyvesant. Yeah. There were some kids in the grades below me that didn't really know me. All they knew was that I went to Stuy. They did not like me a lot. Mm. Um, and I got sent some threats, uh, <gasps> very interesting oh. messages, okay. which uh, I didn't report because I'm such a nice person, oh. but you know. Well, I'm really sorry that you went through, through that, but I think if you want to make that into a story, <laughs> you've got some excellent material there. If you can, it was a very interesting experience. <laughs> I'm sorry you went through that, though. Does anybody else want to share some? Yes, I'm coming. You're in the Yay. back. Yay! Um, I can share. I I related to a lot of what you were talking about, especially in um in the story and in your own experiences. And this was kind of difficult to put into like a beginning, middle, and end. Um, I So, OK, the beginning that I started with, so I'm an only child. Mm -hmm. um, my dad is Ashkenazi Jewish. My mom is Dominican. Oh. And so I started off with, I think in the beginning of my story, just as an only child, thinking more about wanting a sibling. And it was more just an understanding of my nuclear family and less, I don't think I really had a consciousness of my more extended family and those traditions. And then going into the middle, um, I think I sort of focused on developing more of my personality and my interests academically and thinking about, oh, I know I wanted to be a really good student and focusing a lot of my energy towards that and towards those aspects of my identity still not really having yeah. a full consciousness. So I guess my end would be that more developed understanding a little bit mm. of these two sides of my family, which is Definitely not, I don't think, an end, and it's something that is still difficult and still yeah. complicated. Um, um, I, oh, sorry. No, <laughs> yeah, but that, that's, what I, that's what I had, and I wanted to share because I felt like it was sort of related. It is so related, and I'm really glad you shared. And I, I'm kind of amazed because you basically like said the ending of, <laughs> of my talk here, which is just that, which is... For Mia, you know, she's just, I've even got slides. Look at this. <laughs> Her middle is like she's on this journey, and she doesn't know what's going to happen. She's trying to figure it out. And that middle part for her at this moment is just searching and thinking and trying to figure it out. And like, like you just said, like it's not really an end for her. It's the beginning of something else. So that's you said that beautifully, and I can't wait to hear your story. <laughs> thank you for coming. And Emily, thank you for coming. You're welcome. Um, thank you for having me. Before we release all of you out into the world, um, 
Emily's book, Two Tribes, is incredible. <laughs> um, and it's for sale at the table by the door if it's something that you want to take home with you today. Um, you can connect with Emily on social media, follow her yes. story, and stay in touch. Um, and if you're interested in more central synagogue programs like this and not like this at all, <laughs> just visit our <laughs> website to see what we're up to. Um, and just thank you all for being here, for listening, for being so present. Um, thank you all so much. Have a great night. Thank you, guys.